Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we're going to be deciding which element is the best. We're going to be rating the first 20 elements of the periodic table, so let's get started. I decided to put things in a fairly unconventional order here in order to fit the format, so I hope that doesn't upset you too much, and I hope you enjoy it. So let's start off with one like beryllium. Beryllium is that one element everybody sees but no one really cares about. I'm sure almost everybody listening to this video has heard of beryllium before. It's used in x-ray crystallography because it's transparent to x-rays, but it's extremely toxic because it causes something called beryllosis. So beryllium, it's a pretty sucky element. It's not really used in organic chemistry, so we can put beryllium right into F tier. Now let's pick one like calcium. Calcium is in our bones. Calcium sulfate is used in drywall. If you're living in North America, your house is probably made out of drywall. Calcium sulfate definitely has some relevance. Calcium acetate is something that forms hydrates when it's cold, but those hydrates decompose when they're hot. If you haven't seen the video I'm talking about, I'd encourage you to watch the calcium acetate video in the description. Calcium's important, it's in bones. I mean, in organic chemistry, it's not too, too useful. There is this one really cool reaction that you can do where if you take calcium acetate and you heat it up enough, it'll actually convert it into acetone, which is one of the older ways people used to make acetone. So there is some cool chemistry like that that I haven't seen many modern derivatives of. That would be cool to see. So calcium, it's got, it's got a place in our hearts. It's not too, too cool, but it's a little bit cool. So why don't we put it into C tier? Actually, let's put it into B tier, B for bones. Now, I'm not going to go in order because that would be too easy. And we have a lot to get through, so let's just continue. Phosphorus. Phosphorus makes phosphates, it makes phosphenes. One type of phosphate is phosphoric acid. Phosphoric acid is in soda. Phosphorus can go right into S tier. Now boron. Boron might sound boring, but in organic chemistry, boron is anything but boring. You can do hydroborations. You can reduce carbonyls to the corresponding alcohol. If you have an ant problem at home, you can use borax. Boron can also be used for cross-coupling chemistry, so if you do inorganic chemistry or transition metal organometallic chemistry, lots of cool stuff you can do with boron. Boron is OP. Boron is easy S tier. Now compared to some of the other tier lists we've done on this channel, the size for each row is getting smaller so that we can include a face cam here. If you like this format, let me know down below. If you don't like this format, also feel free to let me know down below. And so we're not going to be able to put everything into S tier anymore. We have to be a little bit more harsh. Maybe E tier is going to see a little bit more action now. So aluminum, aluminum's pretty important. In organic chemistry, aluminum forms Lewis acid base complexes. Oftentimes it's too harsh, so we don't want to use it as much as we used to. Trimethyl aluminum sometimes gets used. Outside of organic chemistry, aluminum's used like everywhere for construction. So I think aluminum, we've got aluminum foil or aluminum foil, if you prefer, for both food and chemistry. Aluminum's pretty good. I think aluminum's probably gonna go into A tier and I would consider putting it into S tier, but as I just said, there's just not enough room for everything to go into S tier, but aluminum, aluminum's a pretty decent element. Now magnesium, magnesium makes Grignard reagents. You can use magnesium fire starters. It's used in lightweight applications. I think because of the Grignard reaction, magnesium's gonna be pretty highly rated. Now the disadvantage with magnesium is it even reacts with nitrogen. And if you haven't seen periodic videos, recent video, where they use magnesium in nitrogen, it does actually burn and form magnesium nitride, which I thought was pretty cool. Definitely a video worth checking out if you like crazy reactions. So magnesium's gonna be a solid B tier. The only things that kind of suffer for magnesium is there's the Schlenk equilibrium. Grignard reagents are often not just like methyl magnesium bromide. You're gonna have equilibriums based on the solvent and so on. And they could be more selective than they are. Now, for the biochemists out there, we do also have magnesium as a cofactor for certain enzymes. So, you know, maybe maybe B tier is a little bit too harsh, but there's 20 elements here. They can't all be S tier. So carbon, carbon can be S tier. Carbon's great. Carbon is the basis for life. Carbon is almost all we care about in organic chemistry. Same with hydrogen, right into S tier. So, uh, yeah, so we don't have too much room in S tier, so we're going to have to be pretty harsh moving forward for the rest. Now, silicon. Silicon's okay. Silicon is like carbon's derpy cousin. You know, maybe you have that weird cousin who's a little bit more outgoing and they just speak their mind too much. Silicon's a bit like that. Carbon's happy having tetra substitution, doesn't really want to be penavalent, unless you're George Ola, in which case we can make an exception. But silicon can form hexafluorosilicic acid, and so you can have six things bound to a silicon. Silicon is definitely special. 
Silicon's also a little bit like boron in certain applications, but usually to understand that type of chemistry, you have to start being an inorganic chemist. But we do often use silicon in protecting groups. And if it weren't for protecting groups, we wouldn't have as much total synthesis. Maybe that would be a good thing. So silicon could go right into D tier. Now nitrogen. Nitrogen is another special element. Nitrogen gas on its own is somewhat boring. It only reacts with a few metals at 20 degrees Celsius, such as radium, lithium. But there are other metals it will react with at elevated temperatures. So nitrogen gas does react with metals, believe it or not. It's not as inert as people say. But nitrogen is one of the other key building blocks for life. So it's pretty important. Nitrogen's pretty hard to dispense with. Now, we can be a little bit harsher on nitrogen because the amine type compounds tend to smell pretty bad. Compounds such as amines, they're, they're not great to have around. They're not great to have in the lab. They smell often fishy or uh, like urine, not ideal. So nitrogen containing compounds are okay, but we can put nitrogen into A tier. I said E tier was going to get some action and it hasn't got any action yet. So let's be a little bit harsher. Potassium is an interesting element. You're like, yeah, potassium, okay. But it doesn't really do too much. Sodium, lithium, potassium, they don't do too much. Lithium gets a little bit of a bonus mark because you can often make like carbon lithium type stuff. You can also make carbon potassium type stuff. So if you're typing a comment right now, just stop. Don't even do it. But in general, when we use sodium and potassium in organic chemistry, it's not for like a good reason. It's because this is the one that we usually use for this application most of the time. You will also have like crown ethers that fit around potassium or sodium. Usually people make the potassium ones such as for the use of fluoride and potassium, AT and crown six, as well as the krypton type ligands. But the potassium itself isn't doing anything we really care about. Now, if it was potassium metal, sure, you can do some cool chemistry. NAK, it's pretty cool. But potassium on its own, it's pretty boring. Now you might say, well, there's potassium hydroxide and sodium hydroxide, but what's the common thing there? Hydroxide, not the potassium. So I think we should be a little bit harsher on potassium. Potassium can go right into E tier. Now, if you've ever tasted a potassium salt before, they tend to be fairly bitter. Now, sodium, on the other hand, usually tastes pretty decent. So sodium can be rated a little bit higher than potassium. It's also smaller. You know, people can work with sodium safely if they want a little bit of danger. But uh, still, you know, maybe stuff can go wrong. So I'm not encouraging you to just play with sodium unless you know what you're doing and you have the right safety stuff. But sodium, sodium tastes good. You have MSG, sodium chloride, table salt. Sodium can go right into D tier. I think if we rated sodium higher than silicon that would not be super fair because silicon's also used in like computers and stuff but lithium lithium is a really useful element we have lithium ion batteries in organic chemistry you can lithiate stuff you can form a carbon lithium which is somewhere between ionic and covalent you're usually kinetically able to generate those trap them with various electrophiles something you want to replace with the lithium it's just a pretty decent element it's got a low molecular weight so if you have seven grams of lithium that's a whole mole how many grams of potassium would you need for a whole mole of potassium? Like 40 grams. That's more than five times as much. So it's pretty good. Lithium's got a lot going for it. Lithium, I think, can go into A tier as well. Let's talk sulfur. Sulfur has a lot of different oxidation states. It could be 2 minus. It could be all the way up to 6 plus. Sulfur has a lot of interesting chemistry. And I say this as someone who considers themselves a sulfur chemist. Now, that being said, sulfur stinks most of the time. You have sulfur in most forms, it reeks. It's also not super well behaved. It wants to be oxidized, it wants to be reduced. You could do something like a Swern oxidation where the sulfur was totally fine being sulfur 4, and now it's like, nope, I'm going to sulfur 2. It can go from sulfur with 4 substituents to a sulfur with 2, and it's just like totally content doing that, but then you just leave like a thioether, and suddenly it'll just oxidize back up to sulfur 4. It's like, sulfur, what are you doing? Like, just make your mind up. So sulfur, sulfur will just kind of do whatever. And then when it does whatever, it often stinks, and then the fire department comes. And, you know, if you're doing sulfur chemistry, and you just happen to work by a swamp, if it stinks, people just always come and ask you questions. Hey, are you working with sulfur stuff today? It's like, oh, well, I usually work with sulfur stuff. It's like, well, it kind of smells like sulfur. Like, well, we we work next to a pond. We work next to a swamp. So, uh, you know, sulfur, sulfur can go into C tier because uh, it's got interesting chemistry, but it's definitely got a bad reputation. And I think that reputation is fairly well earned. Now, oxygen. Most of the functional groups we care about in organic synthesis involve oxygen. We have carbonyls, alcohols, epoxides, ethers, oxetanes. So there's a lot of different oxygen containing compounds that matter. You also have oxygen in sugar, right? You have all those alcohol groups. There's also water with oxygen. There's CO2 with oxygen. 
all of those three things, sugar, water, and carbon dioxide, all in soda, oxygen can go right into S here. It also burns stuff, which is kind of cool. The thing that always blows my mind about oxygen is it's just like super reactive and everything's making it all the time and it just stores in the atmosphere and everything's just like, yeah, I guess that's fine. And then our body's like, yeah, we can probably keep breathing. We don't need like these crazy ventilation systems set up for our house to make sure we get enough oxygen. We just kind of trust that we get enough air and it works and that that's worked for now. It's just kind of, it's just kind of crazy that that happens. It works, you know? Okay. Now, fluorine. Fluorine is an interesting element in terms of its products. But if you want to put it onto anything, it's a nightmare. Like there's just not good chemistry for installing fluorine on stuff. You could do it really early and buy your building blocks with fluorine on it. And for the most part, that's what you want to do. You don't want to be putting fluorine onto stuff at a late stage for the most part, because the chemistry is not that good. You're either doing it with fluoride, which has terrible reactivity. It, it's happy being a rock. It's happy being calcium fluoride. Or you have F2 and F2 is like, I'm going to react with everything possible. And I'm also going to get you kicked out of the lab because an accident happened. And then when you get into in between, you have like silver fluoride, which is too expensive. So most people don't want to work with it. And if you still go to like uh, electrophilic fluorine, you have something like select fluorine. Again, it's too expensive and people don't want to work with it. And it's still pretty reactive and non-selective. So are there alternative reagents in between? Sure. Do people use them? Sure. Are they convenient? Are they nice to work with? No. How much fluorine chemistry do you see on YouTube? Not much. That's why. Fluorine can go right into F tier. Does it have applications? Yes. Do its applications salvage it from all of the terrible stuff? Probably not. Chlorine. Chlorine is another like okay element because you can chlorinate stuff, but maybe that's bad. Maybe the chlorinated stuff gets a bad reputation. You think of things like sucralose, which have a bad reputation. There's alkyl chlorides there. Are they safe? Probably, but if I look at them chemically, I'm a little bit concerned. You also have stuff like perchlorates, but those are interesting because of the oxygen, not really because of the chlorine. And can you use them in chemistry? Sure, but most of the time you'd prefer to have a bromide or iodide there anyway. So chlorides, even if you're doing transition metal chemistry, they're just not that reactive. So cl chlorine overall, it's not that great. It's it's okay. It can turn something useless into something more useful, but it's not as good as you'd like it to be. So chlorine, we can probably put chlorine into E tier. So we have three left, noble gases. Helium, helium, liquid helium. Boils at a very, very low temperature, 4 Kelvin. Helium is used for nuclear magnetic resonance, NMRs. And you have party balloons. That's pretty useful. There's also lasers that use helium. Aside from that, that's kind of it for helium. It's just slowly escaping the Earth's atmosphere. It's the second most abundant element in the universe, but it's really hard to harvest that from the universe to bring back here at the moment, given our current technological limitations. So it's all right. Helium's all right. It doesn't do too much. We're talking about what's the best element. And if you can't do much chemistry with it, it's probably not that useful. Helium can go into D tier. Neon. Neon makes neon lights. That's kind of all there is to say about neon. There's a couple other things people use neon for, but that's basically it. So overall, neon doesn't do too much chemistry. So for that reason, neon gets to go right into F tier. It's pretty useless. So our last element, argon. Argon is relatively interesting because it's like 1% of the air that we breathe. So there's tons of argon in your lungs, even right now. And if you're doing really air sensitive chemistry and nitrogen's a problem, you might want to use argon. The other reason why people use argon sometimes is it's more dense than nitrogen. So you can like run it in and it'll displace all of the air out of your apparatus. That can be pretty useful. And occasionally people use argon matrices to trap short-lived intermediates at a really low temperature. The one issue people often run into with argon is that they will use a liquid nitrogen cold finger to trap out any stuff that comes off of their reaction. But if their reaction was done under argon, argon freezes at a higher temperature than liquid nitrogen boils. And so you'll just solidify all that argon into your cold finger. Argon's okay. It doesn't do much chemistry unless you have really high pressures. Then you might get like argon fluorohydride. But overall, argon's, again, another pretty boring element. So we can put argon into E tier. So hopefully you've enjoyed this episode. Make sure you let me know down below if you want me to make more videos like this one about the other elements. It would be cool if you wanted to share this with a friend who you think might enjoy it. And I hope you have a great day.